Okay, welcome to the lesson today. Today we're going to cover the final section of chapter 4 on water resources. We're going to look at how Singapore can avoid water shortage. Okay, right, this set of notes here or this set of slides that you see here are a little different from the master slides that you have in your Microsoft Teams. Uh, generally because it is very wordy and it's very hard to focus when it's all words. Now in addressing the problem of water shortage, Singapore has uh, adopted three approaches and seven, my, seven actions within to help resolve this problem. So today we will be looking at the three approaches and the seven individual actions that Singapore has adopted to deal with this problem at hand. Right, there's an error on the screen here. This is uh, approach one, not approach two. So approach one that Singapore uses is to reduce water consumption. So we're going to look at how Singapore deals with this problem from a consumption standpoint from water consumption. There are two methods employed and we will look at them individually. The first method that uh, Singapore employs is through pricing, water pricing. So on the left you see the gentleman with a very big long bill and the second method is actually to education itself so water pricing uh, is done Singapore's water pricing system is one which penalizes if you use excessive amounts of water so we have a two-tier system where quantity and pricing is linked the more you use if you do use beyond a certain quantity you are taxed at a higher water tax rate as you can see from the table here, which is an extract from your textbook, okay, uh, for domestic consumption, a similar one is used for uh, industrial consumption as well. So, but domestically, when you're looking at consumption of water at home, if you are consuming below 40 meter cube per month, your water price is a dollar and seventeen cents, and your tax rate is at thirty percent. An additional tax of thirty percent is imposed. However, the moment you use above 40 meter cube of water, you will note that the water price increases. Okay, water price itself will increase. The water tax rate will further increase by another 15%. So in total, if you use above 40 meter cube of water every month, the amount of water tax that you're going to pay and the total amount of water price is going to be a lot higher than someone who consumes less water. So what the government tries to do with this system is to let the general population have an awareness of how precious water actually is and to work within your means to not overly consume water or not waste water because access to water is something that we take for granted in Singapore. Um, it is very easy to get access to clean portable water. You just switch on the tap and the water is clean to drink. So the convenience that it brings about uh, brings about a lot of wastage as well. Now you may be thinking what about the very poor people, okay? Because total consumption domestically can be very greatly depending on how many members you have in your family. And uh, if imagine this, if you have a family of 10, right, a family of 10, the total consumption of water domestically is definitely going to be higher than a family of 3. So what if you are uh, the needy and the poor in the country? How are they going to afford it if they, by virtue of the fact that they have larger families sometimes, they consume more? So what you see here is an image of some of the help that is given by the government annually uh, as part of their uh, goods and services tax relief systems. So there is a section here called a U-Safe, okay, GST voucher under U-Safe, that is for your utilities. So uh, for people in the needy group, this amount of uh, U-Safe voucher actually helps to offset uh, and make the water price and power price affordable for them. So we do work on a nobody is left behind idea in Singapore um, through other subsidies and other means of help. The government does try to allow the people to still have a basic standard of living. Uh, if you are thinking of the strategy, it's still a sound strategy. By using water pricing, it allows everybody to realize that water is something that's precious, that it is important and we cannot waste it. So now we come and look at the pros and cons of this method of water pricing. Now pros of course is you will increase the appreciation of the value of water in your population uh, because when you are made to pay more, they realize that hey, water is actually a very valuable thing that we shouldn't waste in such large quantities. Uh, but the con side is when you are looking at it not only from a consumption from domestic point of view, you look at industries, uh, the cost of production of products for industries will go up because of 
correspondingly because of the cost going up the cost of products that you purchase will go up as well right so the please remember the companies and the manufacturers out there their aim is to earn money their aim is not to save money for you so if they were to increase their cost of production they're not going to suck it up and take it out and take it out of their own profit eh? they're going to make you pay for it uh the other big problem with this is the rich may not care so although we talked about the government having schemes to help the poor and if you think about it carefully the rich will have to pay full cost of the water wastage that they in incur the rich may not uh, feel the pinch because they for them this sheer amount of uh, this amount of water of money that they spend on water is insignificant compared to what they are earning so it only deals with uh, a certain sector of the social economic uh, scale not everybody is uh, impacted by this right the second method that we'll be looking at uh, in terms of reducing water consumption is through education itself one of the methods of uh, education is through the WEL Wells scheme, Water Efficiency Labeling Scheme. Uh, it's the one with the many ticks that you see on electrical appliances that uh, consume water. Things like your um, washing machine, your dishwasher. So all these are things that will consume water. Um, so the government in the putting out of this scheme, right, hopes to give the consumers uh, information so they can make an informed choice. Now, why is the making an informed choice important? Because many a times when the consumer knows how much water consumption is going to in be used by these machines, they will tend to pick one that is a bit more efficient because they are looking at long-term costs as well. If, for example, you pick a washing machine with one tick versus one that is four ticks, right? Over the course of a year, you may be saving hundreds of dollars in terms of uh, water. The second type of education that is pumped out by PUB is uh, PUB's water saving kits. Now, uh, if I'm not wrong, right, you can actually apply for one on the PUB website and they will send this kit that you see on the left to you. Uh, basically, it's five stickers and a set of six thimbles. These thimbles are for you to insert into your taps or your showers. Uh, if you look at it carefully, some of the thimbles have three holes, some have four holes. They are of different sizes. The function of these thimbles basically is to restrict the flow of water out from the tap itself. So you're actually reducing a lot of uh, the water flow and uh, what, what some of the benefits get out of this, uh, you at any one time, even if you accidentally switch your tap on and don't close it, right, the amount of water waste is a lot lesser than if it was uh, without the thimble. So once again, this uh, PUB water saving kits are free. Uh, you send them an email or you make an application on the web page and they should be able to send this to you. Uh, when they was first launched, all houses in Singapore actually got one round of this. So uh, why is it that they continue to, to allow you to ask them for more? Because if you didn't uh, enjoy collecting one at the first launch, actually uh, they are now continuing this. So what are the pros and cons of education as a methodology? Now when you look at it, a pros of course is it once again increases awareness and it allows the people to take active action. Like you can apply for the thimble, you can actually put the thimble into your um, water taps and your showers to actually enact change. Okay, But the cons of course is with any, any sort of educational uh, mechanism, it takes time and it depends on your desire for action. What this actually means is if you are an individual who has a very low awareness of uh, or desire to take individual action for this idea of saving water, now you won't do it. Uh. No matter how much education is given, no matter whether we send the thimble to you or you have to apply for it, uh, you are not going to do it because you don't have the desire to take the action. So this is uh, one of the biggest cons in terms of using education as one of the methodologies. Next up, we will look at approach two and the uh, four ways that Singapore used to increase water supply as a second approach towards dealing with water shortage. Now Singapore has four taps that we use to uh, gain our water supply. Uh, you should have learned this in primary school science. I think it's P3 or P4 science. So uh, we will dwell a little bit more about the details of how these four taps work together in unison to resolve our water issues and our water needs. So what you see here is a visual, a visual obtained from the slides as well as from the textbook where you can see our various reservoirs where they're spaced out across the island. Um, 
it may be a bit too small to read off the screen please refer to your notes for uh, a bit more clarity okay so take about a good five minutes to read through the information on this separately so after the lesson in terms of local catchment we have existingly 17 reservoirs two-thirds of the total land area in singapore is uh, our catchment area and through the increase by making use of all our existing drainage networks PUB actually hopes to increase the catchment area to 90% by 2060 now it is important to note that because of the equatorial climate that we enjoy here in Singapore we actually do have enough rainfall annually to cover our requirements and our needs so there is actually more rain than what we can use or than the total amount that's used in Singapore itself so through rainwater itself we actually should not technically have any water shortage issues however you have to understand that land is of a premium in Singapore so if we were to collect every drop of rainwater, there are two main issues that will arise out of this. Um, first and foremost, uh, you will not be able to because there's a lot of runoff and a lot of concrete areas where we do not uh, we actually pull the water and don't store it. Second problem is actually the storage itself. Where are you going to store all this water? We do not have enough space for it. So these are the two biggest problems for that prohibit us from just using rainwater as a solution. Right, so once again, if you look at the pros, rainwater is of course free and uh, so when you look at cost of using catchment as a solution, right, there's only purification cost and storage cost. But like I mentioned earlier, land is a very precious resource in Singapore. So that alone, you're competing uh, with your storage facilities. Now, uh, opportunity cost, what is this idea of opportunity cost? It means that if I use something for a purpose, it cannot be used for another purpose. One of the more common uh, opportunity costs uh, items is, is uh, the idea of time right so if you spend five hours a day on math you're not going to have another five hours for English and another five hours for mother tongue and another five hours for literature and another five hours for geography right you only have 24 hours and you have so many subjects so the, the opportunity cost of using five hours of math is that you're not going to be able to revise as much for the other subjects so similarly, when you talk about opportunity costs in terms of water storage, uh, the land itself, if you're going to use it as a reservoir, you can't use it for anything else. You cannot build a shopping center on it. You cannot build a, a residential area on it. You cannot build an industry on it. So these are problems that we grapple with when we look at using catchment. The second tab that we have is of course imported water. This one you should have uh, come across some news about it on and off in in the past few years actually it's been long-standing issues that we have had with Malaysia on this uh, we have been buying water from Johor since 1927 okay it's actually piped in via the causeway uh, if you look at the picture in the slide here you will see on the right hand side three very long pipes now interestingly two of the pipes actually bring raw water from Lingui Dam in Johor into Singapore that's the water that we buy from them and the third one actually pumps water back out towards them clean pure water purified and clean by us we actually sell the water back to them uh, in the agreement as well so Johor actually has a large dependency on Singapore for cleaned water okay they have a lot of raw water but they are uh, they find it cheaper to buy from us now pros and cons of uh, importing water of course positively you can look at it as uh, you do have low cost right compared to the other two taps that we are looking at later on it is actually relatively cheap to buy raw water and uh, we have assurance of a certain quantity until 2061 because our contract agreement with Johor is until 2061 but the flip side of that is there's no assurance after 2061 so in 2061 which is basically 41 years time you will be in your 50s Okay. by then we will no longer if we do not get a new contract with Johor we will no longer be able to buy water from them so this importing water idea is not a long-term solution now you may be wondering why don't we buy from other countries then because water itself right, is very expensive to transport uh, if you do transport it via uh, the conventional transportation means uh, be it through air sea or rail the cost of the transportation will far away the cost of the water so it is not very likely that we can transport water from thailand indonesia or even further away places it's not something that can be bought in this manner so even between singapore and johor right the the cheapest way to get the transport is to build the pipeline so they pipe it directly to us so you 
Malaysia will not allow you to build a pipeline that cuts across the entire country to Thailand. So when you think of it that way, the larger issue will always be in the long term, this is not a solution that we can rely on uh, actively. Right, so we'll move on to the other two tabs. Okay, the third tab, you've, uh, you've learned about this here and there, bits and pieces, and you may have gone for even learning journeys to new water, uh, new water plant, right? Uh, basically, new water is treating our wastewater and getting it to a point where it's clean enough to drink. Okay. So what do we do? We use a process called reverse osmosis, uh, which uses different layers of membrane, and you push the water through the membranes to clean up the water itself. So if you think back to your science IC task where you were doing some water purification, right? If when you compare to this diagram over here, it is a similar kind of a concept behind it where you do a microfiltration to remove the solids that is within the solution. Uh, you, in this case here, we actually do reverse osmosis. In your actual lab work, I think some of you use heat to do evaporation, to get separation. Um, New water doesn't use evaporation, it uses uh, layers of membranes, so you push the water through. At the end of the membrane layers, right, the water is actually very, very clean, it's, it's good for consumption already. But as a safety mechanism, we do pass them through ultraviolet radiation to disinfect them and to kill all the bacteria. Then it is actually good to, good to drink, okay? It's so clean that it's actually cleaner than tap water itself. 20% of all tap water that we drink in Singapore comes from new water. Okay, comes from new water so you have to remember that this is a very large contributor to our current current water supplies um, where does it come from it comes from wastewater lah. so basically whatever sewage that you flush down the toilet bowl right it actually goes through this three-stage process where it's clean up and then you drink it again and then the cycle is complete pros and cons of using new water pros of course the source is reused water is treat is uh is yeah it's actually wastewater and we do produce a lot of wastewater both residentially and industrially so the cost is the the source itself is not a big issue uh, the cons of this the problem they bring is actually largely psychological a lot of people when we first started new water right that version was there is like you know people say it's oh drink your own pee but actually it's so clean right it's cleaner than your tap water the larger problem in terms of uh, a con for this is cost right new water is not cheap to produce it is a lot higher uh, in cost compared to importing water from malaysia but having just gone through the concept of importing water, right? Now you should understand that importing water is not a long-term solution. So this is why Singapore has pushed so hard for new water. And of course, now we look at the final, uh, final tab. The final tab is desalination. Now, technology-wise, is very, very similar to new water. We also use reverse osmosis uh, to desalinate our seawater. Currently, we have two desalination plants, Sink Spring and Tuas Spring. And the aim is by 2060 to be at 30% of total demand. So if you think of it, 30% here and 20% from new water, half of our total demand will be from uh, water supplies that is, cannot be exhausted. Man. So what's so good about using uh, desalination then? The source uh, of the water is seawater. Okay, we are an island, so technically we have almost an unlimited amount of supply for water. Okay. So the one big con is uh, to do desalination, the cost is even higher. It's got to do with the impurities that's found in seawater. Actually, seawater is so hard to, to desalinate, to remove all the dirty particles, to remove all the salt in it. It is more expensive than new one. So that's sit for a while. Huh? Think about it, it's, it's actually cheaper to process sewage into potable water than to process seawater. Right, the next time you go to the sea and you take a big gulp of the seawater, uh, think about it, okay? Alright, now we're going to look at the final approach, which is approach 3, which is looking at conserving our water resources. So we have covered the three approaches. The final one here is on conservation. Okay, individually, right, uh, the government hopes that we realize that we have a role to play and we all need to keep our waterways clean. So I want to bring you back to your IC task in geography. When we did our reflections, okay, uh, on how you can give a suggestion on how to protect the waterways, that is actually part of this, uh, adopting an uh, individual role. Some of your suggestions include um, putting up posters, reminding people not to litter and taking your own responsibility in not littering into our waterways itself and not polluting the waterways. Okay, that is a very good individual action that you can take. 
Now, the another one of the action that the PUB has actually come up with is this ABC Waters uh, program. ABC Waters actually refer to active, beautiful, and clean water program where um, through a concerted effort started by PUB in 2006, they started allowing people to use the waterways and through this, uh, because you use it for things like kayaking, to catch long, uh, to catch fish in the, the longkang, longkang fishing, you do wakeboarding, etc. You are in active contact with the water. So hopefully it creates this awareness of how clean or how dirty it is. ABC Waters actually refer to active, beautiful and clean water program where um, through a concerted effort started by PUB in 2006, they started allowing people to use the waterways and through this, uh, because you use it for things like kayaking, to catch long, uh, to catch fish in the, the longkang, longkang fishing, you do wakeboarding, etc. You are in active contact with the water. So hopefully it creates this awareness of how clean or how dirty it is. Another program that PUB uh, started was the Friends of Waters program uh, where they actually partner organizations like schools, companies and even some residential community groups, RC groups in adopting waterways that are near your office, near your school or near your residential area. So the objective of adopting the thing is to adopt, clean and protect so you will host regular cleaning activity where people will go in and they will go and clean up the waterways and they will because of the proximity are able to actively protect it from being polluted by uh, either individuals or by by unscrupulous companies who do dumping of materials or, or chemicals into the water. So this is a, a very useful thing for PUB, very low cost for them. Uh, most of the work is done by the partner associations. Now the final one I want to talk about is of course the ABC Water Learning Trail. Uh, some of you may have embarked on this when you were in primary school. Um, this is basically working with schools to create outdoor trails for students and to have uh, volunteers, student docents who will run this program to create an awareness within the primary and secondary school students on what our waterways are like, what are the life, the marine life they find inside to work on the biodiversity as well as to create uh, awareness on what can be done to protect the water trails. So this is yet another one of the conservation efforts that PUB has done. So for in terms of conservation efforts, right, positively, if you look at it, uh, it creates a sense of ownership and it's largely cost effective for PUB. Um, but the problem is it depends very largely on public cooperation and it is actually also very dependent and will get very badly affected by uh, societal events. For example, this period of time where you have the COVID-19 happening, right, uh, all these activities have to be stopped. Lah. Now, finally, in conclusion, what we want to remind you is basically this. Uh, on this planet that we live on, if there's no water, there's no life. So everybody has an active role to play, whether you believe it or not, even though you are just a 13-14 year old kid, you have a role to play, there is a positive part that you can do in every sector of it. Think for a moment in terms of consumption, right? You are a consumer of water, You are some of you are a humongous waste of water at home, right? Some of you are not, I, I totally agree, however that can be tweaked. Uh, in terms of protecting the waterways, you are out there and when you travel to school, when you travel at home, when you are out with your family, you have an active role to play as well. So you have to remember that uh, if you can share what you know, the total amount of knowledge within the community will be higher. The possibility of uh, polluting the waterways or of uh, excessive use of water will be lower. So in, in essence, you have a very important role to play in this. So we've come to the end of this section. Hopefully you gain a better understanding. Once again, I would like to repeat, you have to read the section in the textbook, uh, go through the very wordy set of slides that you have in your teams. This lesson hopes to give you a frame, a general frame and some clarifications about some of the concepts that you will encounter in the textbook as you read them. Right, so that's all for today.